huh. Turns out if you get angry enough, maybe things just actually work. And there's random other people. And I think they're looking at us and can hear us. And there we go. So we better watch what we say now, I guess. <laughs> we can hear you. There we go. Hey, guys. Uh, Hello. Hello. From Edmonton, Canada. We'll uh, just turn this off right away to, so we don't interfere with your presentation. This thing. There we go. Hello. 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 Can everybody hear us? Can anybody hear us? We can yes. hear you. Lovely. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. The joys of Skype. All right. And Mark's presenting. Oh, okay. okay. Great. Welcome to. Uh, our uh, September monthly Q&A. Um, yes. And uh, we thought we'd just kick this off by talking about the fact that uh, next week has come out to Ignite. Uh, most of us, in fact, all of us are going to be at Ignite next week. Uh, that's the whole week there. So if you're at Ignite, we'd love to come and see you. We have a booth there down in the Expo Hall, uh, which we'll be staffing all week. And it's a great time to come and ask us questions and we can dive into any topic you want to talk about on service fabric and outside of service fabric even. Um, if you're attending Ignite, and these all recordings will be available afterwards, these are the sessions that we're presenting up there. You see there's the one that we're just covering on the road ahead and the roadmap. Um, and then we're really diving deeper into Linux, um, how we work and build applications with uh, App Insights, uh, the whole orchestration capabilities. Uh, Chaco is going to do a sex session on managing your clusters, and we're going to do some pretty fun demos in that one. Um, and then finally, we're going to kind of, uh, go more into the um, uh, lift and shift uh, on the Wednesday of how you lift and shift existing applications into Windows containers, run them on service fabric. Um, and then there's a hands on lab if anyone wants to go there and kind of do a bit more practical stuff. So great to see you at Ignite. Come and see us. And with that, we're going to um, stop sharing. Um, let's switch back. And start on our monthly Q and A. Yeah, let's get rolling. So we've already got some questions in the IM window here. Uh, so the first one I see was there one before this? One earlier? Yes, there's one earlier. There's one way up here. When are single node clusters for production going to be supported? <laughs> uh, any limitations that the application is delayed, deleted after a restart of the node? Otherwise, persist applications as a driver starts. So the, it, they won't be deleted. They'll come back. Um, but the issue is that there's no real HA. Like, you could get almost all the same features from an NT service. So uh, we, we always kind of ask, you know, what is, the, what is the main purpose that actually you're trying to achieve? Because when we think about service fabric, we usually think about it in terms of HA um, and, and making things like upgrades work and, and stuff like that. Um, if if you don't care about upgrades and you don't care about HA, um, it, we always like to know kind of what the scenario is where a single node is is useful. Um, I mean, it's not that you can't run it, but it's just that you know if you phone up our support and the machines on down and you lost your cluster, there's nothing we can do. Right. I mean, one machine down is is a yes. uh, is the end of the world. So, um, one, I mean, if it, one thing that we're working on is we're working on making sure service fabric works in dev tev dev test um, service. So that's maybe one place that you're talking about if it's a dev test scenario. Well, this, yeah. this particular question is about production clusters. Uh, if you're not worried about HA, and at that point, if, if you have a support call, the only thing you can advise you of is go look at your app. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why it, I mean, this, this whole thing puts us in a bad spot. Like, what, am I, what are we supporting you? If it's just supporting our SDK, absolutely we will. So that's why we come out and say don't use a single single node in product. But I think if you if you really have a need for this and you want the same environment, um, you can probably reach right. out to us and, and we'll figure out how to you know put you on the list of people who have actually tried this um, and, then and what to know, do about know it. the caveats. Can yeah, you guys know your caveats. What what is achievable? What is not I achievable? Think, what is SLA? What can you expect? Yeah, I think communicating right. that not just with us but with your customers are the is the major. Is the major caveat. So, uh, next question uh, from John. So, actor perf counters. The fact the only way to get them in half is to surprise them through Azure Diagnostics, because they're using a SQL ID as part of the perf counter ID. 
Uh, <laughs> can anything be done about that? I don't know off the top we, of my head. We will actually. This is this is a setting which comes from them from absent side, so we'll actually uh, send that to them as a as a feedback. So truly, we don't have an answer. Yeah, deep would be the one. Yeah. This one just goes back to them. That's yeah. their their theirs. I'm sorry, there's one above that, man. Really? Yeah. This one? Uh, while well, testing resilience. Six foot game services. Oh, there we go. So there is. Sorry about that. So while testing resiliency with the node transition API, we know it's both local dev and remote find cluster. The downing a single node could take out the entire cluster. <laughs> Probably not, but let's figure out what's going on. The listener on port 1900 vanishes, oh, and we have to set the cluster. As soon as comments are the culprit node is acting as the primary for several system services. A local cluster. Uh, notice always zero. Uh, that's really surprising. I would say open an issue and we can help you figure it out. If you're running with more than one replica, this shouldn't be happening. Um, on, a on a local dev cluster, I can see that happening because we have we do a trick on the local dev cluster. Since it's all in one machine, it has to know zero. Every, no, no, no. Every, uh, every node uses a different port for the, um, for the cluster endpoint, for the gateway endpoint. Right. So 19,000 is used on one node, but the other nodes use 19,010 and then 20 and 30 and 40. Yeah. Because they all need unique ports. So if your code only connects to 19,000 and you happen to take down that node on your local dev cluster, then yeah, you won't be able to connect anymore. And for remote. But in remote, in a, in a Azure cluster port or a production cluster, that shouldn't happen though. Yeah. Because yeah. you should get, you, sh you should get routed to a different node by the load balancer that's at least an Azure load balancer sitting in front of the, yeah, I would say open up an Azure uh, and a GitHub issue and show us your cluster config, the actions you took, and what errors you're getting back on the production cluster. And we, particularly on the production cluster, but we'll we'll help you sort out both. Yeah, that, it makes sense to on local, but on remote clusters, you shouldn't see. Yeah, you shouldn't see that. So um, we can figure that one out though, because that shouldn't be happening. Uh, we did the active work counters uh, from Stracker Alexander. I'm missing something like Docker Hub. Um, yeah, but for service fabric. Yes. Uh, something where community can share services, log aggregation, pubs of messaging, key value. Yeah. So, I mean, at the moment, uh, yes, there isn't anything that specifically where we can publish service fabric services to. It's actually been an ongoing kind of ask for a while, actually, that we've thought about. I mean, at the moment, there is, you know, images that you can pull down and deploy them and run them inside containers. Um, and, you know, you can publish things inside new, well, you can publish and build your own new game packages. Uh, but there's nothing specific that we can hook up to. But we hear you on this one. Uh, the fact that where is there sort of a marketplace for service fabric services that I can pull things down from and hook those up. And we've certainly been thinking about this one a lot, but there's nothing in the plans right now um, other than just using Docker images that you can pull down um, and run them because service fabric is a container orchestrator. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I keep jumping back and forth between mm -hmm. things here. Okay. Right. So, has everybody caught up in their own IMC? Yeah. yeah sometimes yeah. you just yeah. can say okay. application okay. insights was updated recently uh, with no real specific um, comments. Um, this is affiliated to a group and through a release notes for the forthcoming compile release notes. Um, yep. We'll take this as a, as a feedback. We'll, we'll put something in there. We actually did. Yeah. As I was say, you you caught me on a typo on that one. It's application up insights dot service fabric, the NuGet package. Yes. Um, the NuGet package. Yes. Uh, um, we probably need deep in the room, actually, unfortunately, and he's not here today because he deals with all our app insight stuff, and we will find out on this. But yes, there is an application in, uh, inside called service fabric native package that allows you to need, it takes, allows you to publish custom events from the service package into app insights. So you see all of the custom information, things like your replica set ID, uh, partition ID, and information like that. They might have done an update on that recently. So uh, if they have, then I'm presuming that might have added some more functionality, but we'll we'll put some. We have a release coming out next week, and we'll make sure there's something in the release notes there about it. And also, there'll be there'll be a revised uh, doc on that as well, both for OMS and App Insights. Yeah, that's shipped so by the App Insights it, it, team. It will come in the next week. Yes. So it's it's in the, it's in the hopper. Yes. Yeah. Like, so next week. Carol here. So uh, we updated the package with um, correlation support for service remoting. That was the major update. And if you look at the GitHub um, site of this package, uh, there are detailed release notes there. Great. Thanks, Carol. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. Oh. Also, deeply yeah. OK. So so the next one's from Art. Uh, when running ASP.NET Core Web API service type, what is the recommended to do compression? Uh, 
I have an example of that, but I, I think it's just the normal response compression. I yeah. don't think we care. We don't. We don't care. You do yeah. whatever. Whatever is recommended by, uh, by Web API, by ASP. Yeah, but I think it's just standard use response compression, and then that yeah. turns on either gzip or deflate or whatever the default is that's supported by that platform. Um, is there a way to restart a service type without restarting or pausing the entire node? Yeah, there's restart service fabric replica. That'll get a particular um, process or a particular replica within a process. And then there's also de uh, restart service fabric deployed code package, I believe. Uh, that'll restart the process on a given node uh, without having to deactivate the entire node. But there isn't there isn't a way when you say service type. Yeah. There's no way to restart all instances of a specific service type with one command. So you can you can you can put together a script using some of our queries though to find where all of these service instances of a type are running and then you can restart all the code packages yeah. for those service instances just in a loop. Yep. That you can do. Yep. We I mean, definitely don't need to restart the entire node. Yeah, I mean, well, any, anytime, anytime you're restarting a single service or replica, you shouldn't be touching the entire node. Was 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 that the question? How to restart a node? Or? No, it was how to restart a service type. Yeah, it has all there, there without right? without restarting the entire node, which you never should have to restart. Yeah, you entire should not do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Built-in service to let us query service type process info, memory, CPU, disk port usage. Um, so. And then the the follow-on question is how does the how does the cluster decide where the request goes? We don't decide where the request goes. Um, we don't we don't usually really participate in that routing. Um, yeah, you decide actually. You decide. Um, you may want to look into the there's a bunch of docs that we have on the cluster resource manager. I can drop a link into uh, the IAM window and also um, connecting and communicating with uh, Service Fabric Services that I think will help you tease these two things apart. Service Fabric treats these things very separately. So there's um, figuring out how to lay out the cluster, how to balance it, and then there's also how where requests go and how they get routed. And those things are, are separate. Um, so I'll drop some some links to docs into the into the item window. Do we have do we have load metrics automatically reporting CPU disk in memory now? We do for we memory, memory right? uh, we do for memory and CPU if resource governance is on for yeah, that okay. particular package. There you go, okay. Um, if it's not on for that package, then we're not watching. Perfect, um, yeah. So, that, so that's, that's another thing. Yeah, and those and those are load metrics. So those are things that either your code is reporting, which means you wrote code to report on it, or you're using the automatic ones if you're using resource governance. But other than that, um, you'd have to turn to performance counters to, to get that information. Yeah, I think it's performance counters and monitoring is usually the way that we expect to see this come out. Yeah. Um, what is collect guest logs I don't question. think that that's one of ours. Yeah, so I'm, look familiar to me. I'm willing to bet that that's uh, something that comes from the Azure Compute thing. Um, there is a GitHub issues list for VM scale sets. Um, I can try and find that uh, that uh, URI. Um, I would dump that question into there, and and we can help you if you want to tag one or two of us in it. Yeah. Um, we can help you figure out what that is, but that's not something that Service Fabric produces that I'm aware of. So this most likely must have been put by a CSS person if you had called in for some support. Yeah. So that looks like a CSS support tool. Yeah. And your last question is, are all our services, do they use the latest version of Service Fabric? Just curious. Yes, we hold them to the same bar in terms of making sure that they um, upgrade to the latest versions. And we have to make and we ensure that they roll out and upgrade to uh, within the 60-day window that we have for all our external customers as well. So they pretty aggressively move ahead with putting out new versions, and we often roll out a new version with them as well before we roll out publicly as well. So uh, I think they're, yes. usually, they're usually pretty aggressive to take on the new versions, especially yeah. SQL and Docker. And then also, like TV. even SFRP, the computer resource provider, any of those core resource providers are the first ones to get our new version even before we roll it out public. So they act as our canaries before we go out anyway. So uh, first parties do get it first. And then the, the other ones, like for example, the Cosmos DBs and other who are also separate businesses, they also adopt it very quickly. Okay. <clears throat> Do you recommend a number of reliable dictionaries in the stateful service? Any issues with considering a large numbers of them? I mean, number. I mean, there's no hard limit. No, but 
there are practical limits. Uh, I don't remember the exact latest density. There, there is a, I mean, we, we tend to say, you know, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 yeah. uh, state providers per uh, replica seems to be a sweet spot. Um, when you get more than that, the number, th there's work that is per state provider, and then there's work that's per kind of record. Um, the per state provider work starts to overwhelm uh, the replica, or it can in certain scenarios, but it's not a hard and fast rule. And again, you know, 100 to 1,000 is, is a really big range. Um, I would say do profiling um, and, and see where your, your hotspots are. Um, and see where the consumption is coming from. Yeah, I mean, it does kind of also matter how frequently you access those collections. Right, too. if they're cold, then they're all going to get flushed out to this bang, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So unfortunately, there's no there's no strict guidance there um, around a particular number. Um, I think performance testing is probably the, the best and only good way to really know um, for your workload, for how you're using the collections, where that tipping point might be. But yeah, I'd say under 100. And, like, I would say under 100, there's absolutely no problems unless you put 5 million things in each collection, at which point now you've got a different problem. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where there's a sweet spot, um, and it's going to be per workload where the number of transactions you have and on if they're on different keys and how long the transactions take to complete, and things like that. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a single number we can just give you. All right, let's combine a couple of questions here. Is there going to be a new release uh, for Ignite? And if so, what are the changes in that build, along with any time frame for the next SDK tooling and things related to additional options for transport and serialization? So let's take the first thing. So yes, there's going to be a new release next week for Ignite. This is why we're, <laughs> we're looking extremely tired. <laughs> yeah. that partly because it's, uh, you know, it's a new release. And it's going to be, there's going to be a release of the runtime that we're calling 6.0. And there's release of the SDK, which we're calling the 2.8 SDK. Um, and you know, so you'll see you know, kind of a wealth of new stuff inside it all, I guess, in terms of things. Certainly, we fix a lot of issues and address them all. In terms of new things that we have inside of the all. Um, yeah, there was a specific question about uh, transport and serialization. Yeah, so that is coming in the 2.8 SDK. If you're talking specifically about the service for remoting the stack, um, I think that's actually part of that was released in 2.7, but it'll be completely rolled out in 2.8, and then you'll be able to do custom serialization for service promoting. There's also, in addition to 2.8 and 6.0, there's also a 3.0 preview of yes. the SDK that's coming out, and that has our .NET standard 2.0 support. Uh, so be on the lookout for that too. Yes. So, so I think I mean in terms of I think what you'll hear is you'll hear us talk a fair amount about uh, Linux side of things. Um, you'll. Uh, Here's talk a lot more about uh, how we've done deeper integration with OMS and App Insight. Um, we've done a lot of work there to make diagnostics better experience with OMS. Um, in terms of in the product itself, uh, I think that you know, you'll see that we've it's the Linux side of things that will be the big prominent thing that we're going to be talking about. Yeah, Linux, um, Linux across platform, I would say. Linux across platform. And the big themes. Um, we've done a fair amount inside some things inside the portal as well there. Which is yes, and, and, the, and the secure cluster would actually be slightly, I mean, one of the biggest things we've heard from you guys are the certificate rollovers using thumbprints is a pain. And it also creates incidents for us. So we would now support common name as a way to deploy your certs. So instead of using thumbprint, you would use common name and issue a thumbprint. In that way, all you need to do is basically deploy a new certificate, and the, cert the new certificate just gets picked up based on the end date of the, or the expiry date of that certificate. So we just use the one which expires the last. So in that way, the rollover of certs becomes very easy. So that's something which is a important thing which is coming in 6.0. Yeah, I think the good news is all the things that we're going to talk about and the demos and things like that are all recorded in a whole bunch of sessions. And yeah. so kind of by Thursday of next week, you'll be able to watch all of those and see yeah. kind of all of the, basically, the announcements that we're going to do at Ignite next week. OK, then we can combine two other questions as well, which was about the volume driver, and that is, uh, where was it? It was uh, from Marcin. From Marcin. It's, I remember Martin was talking about block storage volume driver, and Marcin asking the same question in terms of when to, what's this now in terms of the service traffic volume driver. Yes, we're actively working on a volume driver. 
which is a block storage volume drive that acts as directly on the file system. So you can store all your local state on the file system. We showed a preview of it at night. Um, as you imagine with all block file systems, it's quite a challenging thing to get right. Uh, we've been working on it pretty hard. We're trying to get to a preview that you'll see um, this year, I would even like to optimistically say in November. So you're probably about six weeks away from us giving a preview around to you. It's the sort of time frame we're looking at. Um, and then we'll push it out as a preview and then get a whole bunch of feedback on that. So yes, we made a lot of progress on it. It's still on our roadmap. It's one of the big features that we're trying to get out soon. Uh, yeah, that we promised and we showed that build. Um, but as with all these things, you know, because it's a fairly complex thing, we're spending a lot of time making sure we're testing it thoroughly. So that's the sort of time frame for it. Uh, I'm sorry uh, if I understood correctly. You were talking before about two different volume drivers, uh, and one of those volume drivers was um, local cluster uh, stored, like yes. uh, replicated in memory and persisted like reliable collections. And the right. second volume driver was intended to run on Azure block uh, block blobs. Am I oh. correct? Yes. Uh, yes, I would say that. Without saying too much, because it's not in our product, it's in the Azure storage team. Um, you know, they they are looking at how they provide one for Azure generally, which is a volume driver for containers that can be used with anyone who wants to use that. Um, that's being built by the Azure storage team. But I would, you know, I can't comment on anything about what they're doing or their time frame or anything else like that. Um, okay, but uh, do you do you expect that it is going to work on both Windows and Linux? Because um, there are some issues about running uh, Docker volume drivers on Windows. Yes. Uh, yeah. The answer is I don't know. Um, given the given the emphasis we have on building things for our own products, I'd like to think it is, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, let me go and ask them, the storage team and see if they're prepared to say anything about any of this. But quite frankly, I am not able to speak on their behalf. I can only talk about our volume driver that we're building. So, um, okay, thanks I, a lot. I can't say more about that, I'm afraid. I don't know, I don't know the answer. But I will go and find out for you and see if they're prepared to make any form of more definitive statement. Okay, but yes, you are right. There are, there are two approaches to this. Certainly our volume driver will be extremely performant because it'll use our replication technology and it's fully self-contained inside the cluster, which is the advantages of it. Okay. Uh, we jumped around. Yeah, no, I, think, yeah. I think we just got to this. So there was a question about uh, how can you version service separately as part of a VSTS pipeline? Is that, that one that we're stuck on? Yeah, that one That one I don't know. That's. Uh, I don't know how to do it specifically within VSTS. So yeah. ideally what you're looking for is um, what we'd call a, a partial or a differential build. Um, in VSTS, they also have what they call um, deterministic builds, where if the source files haven't changed, then the binaries that are produced are identical. Um, Service Fabric hashes and checksums things. Um, so if you were doing a regular build, like if you're doing a build on your laptop, every single time you build, something about the metadata will change, and you'll get different actual binaries out at the end. Um, uh, Service Fabric checks to make sure that when you version things that or don't version things, that they either have changed or haven't changed. So we, we put that gatekeeping in. So if you don't have that repeatable build, what will happen is you'll create the new package and upload it. You'll have changed the version for the thing that you know you made a bug fix in. And you won't have changed the version for the things that didn't change. But the situation is that Service Fabric knows that those binaries are different, and we stop that from uploading because we don't know which is accurate, the version number that didn't change or the binaries that did. Um, so the repeatable build thing helps fix that, right? So if you're not versioning things and you're uploading the whole package all over again, then we'll let the change package go through. The other ones won't be changed, and their version won't be changed, and you're good. But for how you actually like tag those different services with different versions, I know that there's a VSTS, there's a couple of different VSTS tasks out there that help with this. Um, and there's a raw PowerShell one where you just get access to the SDK, and I know people have built this pipeline in that thing, um, but I don't know the specific steps to say for VSTS to directly build, say, part of your part of your tree, uh, and then turn that into a specific service and version and stuff like that. That's something we can follow up with 
um, and, and get you an answer for Yeah, Andrew, if you post that question on GitHub, our resident VSTS expert is in Sweden, so he's probably asleep right now, but we can probably get that answer for you if you yeah. post that up on our GitHub issues repo. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Just, just to clarify a bit, um, so we build and we, we're using the template um, service fabric uh, template VSTS build, yes. um, and, that, and that versions the that package. Um, yeah. So every service gets versioned, whether it's changed or not, when the build runs. So I was concerned that every service is being updated, even though it may not have changed. Yeah, and I've, I've heard I've heard this before, and I know there's a way I know there's a way to to get around that. I just I don't know the mechanics off it off the top of my head, but we can definitely get that answered for you if you remind send us a reminder up on GitHub, and we'll help you. Yeah, out. I'd say open an issue for you and we'll walk it through it. But I, it's definitely possible. The the main yeah. service fabric is very geared towards only doing these kind of differential updates where only one thing changes and we can identify that. That's why everything is independently versioned, is so that we can make this determination. Um, if you go and just change the version all the time, we think everything's changed and we go and roll it out. But what we want to get to is only the versions for the things that actually change are what change, and then we know that that's the target of the actual upgrade. Yeah, OK, thanks, guys. Cheers. OK, yeah. any updates from full ASP.NET Core from, to from Todd Abel? Todd Abel? No, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hey, uh, I recognize that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Todd Great. used to work on the team. Uh, Great question. Great Todd. question, Todd. <laughs> All right. So there's, there's, two, there's a couple things missing today for full ASP.NET Core 2 support. So the first one is uh, WebListener. The ASP.NET team kind of repackaged WebListener. Um, and so we are releasing our own package to work with that. It's called HTTP Sys now, and it was bundled up with one of the other ASP.NET Core packages. Uh, so in our next release at Ignite, you'll have support for HTTP Sys and ASP.NET Core 2.0. And then the other thing is actually compiling against .NET Core 2.0, and that's what we are releasing a preview of is our NuGet packages will target .NET Standard 2.0, so that 3.0 preview that we're releasing pretty soon that will allow you to target .NET Core 2.0 for your application. So then you'll be able to write full on ASP.NET Core 2.0 services and actually target .NET Core. Yeah, and we'd like to try and land that, you know, certainly get it out this year. Yes. Um, as soon as we can. Yeah, this year often being before December. <laughs> yeah, pumped up with it. Okay. okay. Uh, on a five note cluster with an NLP for load balancing, when I begin the rolling upgrade process, I sometimes see that one of the nodes gets stuck in the upgrade process. How can that be avoided? It's a bug. If it if that is the case, so file file a GitHub issue with we we'll, we'll like to take a look. This would never happen. But well, what's the recommendation for getting around it? Well, you got to look it at the, the look at the status of the upgrade and see what it's waiting on. Um, usually, what happens is that there's something else that Service Fabric is trying to ensure some safety check or move a replica somewhere else and something else is causing that check to not pass. So it just sits there and, and keeps trying and keeps checking and keeps trying and keeps checking. Um, and then uh, eventually might time out and roll back. But if it's never making it in, there's some precondition that's not even passing. So I would say, look at um, your health, look at the health of the cluster, look at the health of the node, see if there's anything that's obviously unhealthy because those health checks then won't pass and we won't proceed. Um, and I would also say, um, look at the, you know, get the detailed upgrade information. Um, it might not be all present in SFX. You might have to go to the PowerShell and really pull back the data. Um, but that usually has a detailed list of what health checks and what operations that uh, upgrade is, is waiting on um, before it would proceed. So I'd say that's that's two things to check out. Yeah, if these are application upgrades, a common a common thing that can go wrong is if one of your services run async isn't exiting on time, then that can hold up an upgrade as well. There's one node though, so that, that's interesting thing. He says one of the nodes gets stuck. So yeah, I think we'd also not, like the not node. even a process. Nodes should not get stuck. So it's yeah, confusing. we'll find out. Yeah, so the, the one thing which I have noticed off late is if someone is provide is doing a say a VSTS, sorry, VMSS model change. I've seen the very last UD get stuck. And in all all the analysis I've done, all the incidents, I've seen that it's because of the Windows Azure diagnostics extension getting stuck. If that were the case, then I would say file a CSS incident and so that those guys can fix it. Uh, that, so that's one thing which you would see. So uh, that's not a service fabric upgrade, of course. Okay, uh, let's go on to Rich's question. He's got three questions. 
any recommend which are all sort of slightly related. Any recommendation for doing an event sourced approach directly in service fabric? Do you mean uh, sort of a venting model where you have pub sub eventing and or or you deal with events from other resources? Um, I don't know if you've seen the thing that we did announced recently, which was event grid. Um, maybe that's the sort of thing you're looking at. Um, event grid allows you to listen on events that happen on other service fabric resources, like I check a file onto this file system, or I update this table inside this database. Is it's within your service fabric applications? There's no pub sub mechanism built into service fabric today, but we've pointed people in the past to a number of different open source projects that people have done. One from a uh, cat guy, uh, an Azure customer advisory team guy called Paolo Salvatore. Um, I don't know if that's what you're referring to. It seems to answer your last question as well, yes? Uh, with regards to a decoupled approach for inter-service uh, messaging event subscription. Yeah, there's, yeah, we don't, we don't ship any components in service fabric, but we usually recommend using something like Event Hub, Service Bus, or Event Grid if you're looking for events from uh, infrastructure, other Azure infrastructure. But we've seen people host all sorts of queuing technologies, like we see people host RapidMQ as well yeah, in the process and use that. Um, and then, you know, you can use the Azure ones that are running inside Azure. The RabbitMQ one, we usually see people run that on-premise quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and then with regards to an append-only reliable store, uh, key structure, key structure records. Is that, uh, Any chance APIs will be open to extend extended. things like this? You're going to be able to build your own data structures? Is that what you're asking? I mean, eventually, we do have a reliable log that sits underneath a lot of things, but it, it, it's not too much more than what you'd get from um, CLFS common log file system or file store. I forget exactly what that stands for. Um, someday we'll we'll directly open up that um, that log for you to use. Um, but what we'd probably rather do is there's a bunch of APIs further up um, that we want to uh, make public so that you can write your own data structures without having to do everything directly against the log. Um, we're working on cleaning up those APIs. Part of the thing was that we made them for the first, you know, reliable queue, uh, reliable dictionary that we built. Um, and then as we've added more data structures and, and kind of learned more about how things should work, we've been refining those APIs internally. Um, so we keep changing them because we figure out, oh, we, we should combine these or, oh, we should make the relationship between these two parts more clear. Um, and so those APIs continue to churn, and so that's part of why we haven't opened them up yet. But once we're pretty sure that we've got a, a well-defined API for writing new data structures, we'll definitely make that public. Um, and that will um, mean that you don't have to operate quite so down at that low log layer. You'll get a lot of the, the coordination and work already done at a higher level API. Um, we probably will open the API for the direct log eventually, but I have no real time frame on when either of these is going to fundamentally happen. So. It's something we're aware of um, and we're working towards it. Okay, we've got a lot of few questions here. We're going to speed up a little uh, is, bit. Is Docker Compose going to eventually replace service fabric applications? No, definitely not. Uh, is it just a side project? I wouldn't call it that either. It's more for lift and chip scenarios. So if you already have a Docker Compose based yeah. application, you can just take it and run it on service fabric. That's, that's basically the idea, but it's definitely not replacing our application model. Yeah. I just think you'll see inside service fabric generally that we're going to support any form of industry standard models that come out, whether it's the one that we have or Compose, and I'm sure there'll be others, and we're certainly very focused on allowing you to run different types of containerized or application models on top of service fabric, so you'll see three more of that approach as we go forward. Did you abandon the idea of SF and you get? Not really, no. We mentioned for, we'd love to do it, it's just a priority thing right now, um, but it's still on our, on our list of things. It's just, I think that um, we're going to get to that list and reevaluate that list a little bit towards the end of this year, and we're trying to push it up the list. Um, when will there be a Docker volume driver plugin? Oh, we talked about that one. Um, that works with service fabric later this year. Hi, any benchmarks and performance uh, stats for service fabric to service to service communication using service remoting versus HTTP and guest role? Uh, we don't have anything published, but we do have a project up on GitHub that you can run yourself and take your own benchmarks that you can kind of use against your own workloads because it tends to depend on what kind of request response patterns you have. So we don't have published, we don't have any uh, performance metrics published that compare those two directly now. But we do give you the tools to go 
create your own that are kind of what you'd actually see, you know, your size of payloads, your type of call pattern. Yeah, I mean, the ASP.NET Core team, they published some numbers for Kestrel, but, you know, they're, they're, the, absolute, they're the absolute ceiling of what it can handle. So empty response is not necessarily realistic scenarios, but they'll at least give you an upper ceiling. So we don't publish numbers that are similar to that, but we give you a project that you can run and kind of tune towards your own workload and see if the numbers meet your... And you also get to see it on your hardware. And on your hardware, too. That's a good point. They ran, the ASP.NET guys, when they ran the Kestrel benchmarks, the, the, the original one, when they got one point something million requests per second, that was on a Godzilla sized machine. Um, and they were just sort of empty payloads. So, you know, the, the, that's the thing. When, if you publish those kinds of numbers, you always tend to have to take them with a grain of salt because your results are probably going to vary based on your hardware and your actual workloads you're running on. I check it. What does it mean to use server dur durability tier that requires a full CPU core? Okay. So I think I, I will give you a longer answer because I think I've attempted this answer this question on Yammer as well. So if you step back and think about what is durability, I mean, what, what is this concept? The concept basically is saying that when Fabric Controller, who actually happens to be the layer below us, is trying to update its own host. So if the host machine happens to be 32 core machine, it needs to evict up to 32 VMs from from that from from itself before it can it can remake or re, re, reboot itself. So now let's talk about what what happens if a safe if there is a VM which is a partial core. Now think about the combinations that you'll have to deal with. So the rule at this point, and there is a only negotiated rule which will allow us to have the velocity. Azure needs to do for rolling out its own upgrades is that a customer can a customer on service fabric which has a a silver durability basically has some kind of 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 privilege to block an update has to be a single core so that is the root cause of that that particular requirement so now let's talk about your b1 question so b1 today means that it is actually a single virtual core. So virtual core by definition is not a one physical core by itself, we we'll start with. And then when it's a bustable one, you're saying you will get from 10% all the way to 10, 200%. So now you're talking about partial, like part partial core at that point. So that's one of the reasons why I had indicated that B1s are something which truly, if you even try to do it, we are not blocking it because of a bug on our side. That we will go fix but the the right supportable model for you if you're trying to leverage anything useful in the silver durability would be to have at least a b2 which just gives you at least two cores and the bcs itself i would discourage unless you are on a, on a, on a larger skew then you know that you actually can guarantee that you're occupying certain percentage a sizable percentage of the physical node and that's the reason why we, why i said that B1 MS is not a great skew to be on. Um, what happens if you do? Most likely it will run because today B1 is a brand new skew. Not many people are on it. If it turns out that it, it becomes very popular and on the one physical machine, there are 72 VMs on it. Guess what? You will not get the 10% of uh, 10, 10 minutes you're expecting in silver durability to give you. So. It's just a cost versus benefit. You need to figure out for yourself, are you an evictable workload? If you are an evictable workload, yes, go for it. But do not put your primary primary node types on a B1. Okay, um, my uh, I'm asking this question because I would like to know which size of B would give me this guarantee. I understand the uh, all this um, all this resource sharing stuff, and uh, this is why I'm asking specifically what does it mean in terms of uh, the B series? Because if you say, for example, B4 is good enough then uh, it's okay for me. Uh, I like, uh, I really like the B series because uh, uh, I have some ideas about um, running autoscaler on B series because look, uh, uh, short bursts can be accommodated by um, uh, just by burst. Uh, you have the long running metric that shows uh, how many credits uh, do you have remaining in your scale set. This means this is much um, 
much more predictable uh, metric than just uh, mm, five minute uh, last the life last five minutes of, of load so you can predict that you will uh, go short of resources burstable resources for example in one hour then you can provision more resources and you are um, targeting against the uh, CPU credits remaining. So this, uh, this might be really nice uh, platform to run a uh, uh, workload that scales and scales up and scales down. No, agreed, agreed. I think at this point, I don't have a recommendation for you to run yeah. on Bs at all. If it were, I would just say B4 seems, seems to be very reasonable given that there is uh, like a, a four CPU, four virtual CPUs with 90% guarantees on, on the CPU. So that may be a good one to start with. So at this point, we don't have any workloads. Internally, we work, we run on Bs. So that actually is the honest answer. I think we're just it's so new, we need to figure some of this out. Yeah, and most likely we would exclude so that from our support. It sounds like we need to spend yeah. some more time. But you have a good, and, good and use think, case. Yeah, and, good and, use and case. I think we're working on generally getting more crisp guidance on which uh, VM SKUs we've actually tested and validated and what we'd recommend. Uh, versus ones that are new and we might not, you know, until we make a statement, you can consider it not supported, that kind of thing. We got to get that kind of guidance out there. Given that and I don't want it so quick. Yeah, even that they're all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we're working on a whitelist. So, okay. Um, Marcin, you also said you're, you're looking to integrate or try and use RocksDB with the low level replication stuff. I don't know why someone's telling you it's a bad idea. I would say experiment away um, and let yeah. us know what you, yeah. what you find out. Yep. Um, next question is. Um, what are deployment best practices in the service fabric? Because um, yeah, there's a big talk I'm having at the yeah. night, one hour talk on just this topic. Yeah. So, you know, in a week you will have a recording of it. Yeah. Okay. So, so we also have support and documentation. Yes. 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 So recording is there and documentation. Um, Java is a native language. Yeah. So that's actually out in preview today uh, for Linux. There'll be an update available at ignite it'll mm -hmm. still be in preview but you'll still be able to but you'll be able to write job applications on linux um and we also have an eclipse ide plugin to help you out with that yes. uh, i believe the, the main thing is that stateful services will be available for you in java uh, in the coming weeks as a follow-up there what i was looking for was java on windows support java on windows i mean that's it's we're not releasing that right away. We do have plans to do it. Uh, there's no reason it shouldn't work, obviously, but we um, we're not releasing that as an official thing yet. But it'll be coming. Up yeah, that'll probably come after the Linux one. Yeah. Um, whether or not they both GA at the same time is still kind of TBD. But we we did a little survey of our internal customers, and we didn't see too much actual Java Java on Windows. Um, we saw a lot of Java on Linux, and so that's where we've been focusing on it. But we, we do need to make it symmetrical, and it is going to be symmetrical eventually. Um, question is, is the only way to trigger restore to use the start partition data loss method? Uh, yep, that's, that's where it is. Um, and we realize that that is a really scary name uh, and not ideal, um, but that is where you have to chunk the code today. Um, in the future, there will be a backup and restore service that will hide some of this from you, um, so you won't have to do quite as much work. Um, but that restore code that sits in the on data loss will still have to be there. Um, that's that's really the only place for that to go. That's kind of a historical reason. Uh, that's where Service Fabric has an opportunity to rewrite uh, all the state. Um, and so when you're doing a restore, that's where the restore kind of fits in. I, I agree that it is scary and weird sounding. Um, so we should probably fix that and give it a better name sooner or later. But that that's the right point. And we're building we're building and built a preview of a backup and restore service. Is that coming up for next week? Uh, we're already in preview at this point. It's preview, but yeah. we're going to release it for next week. Uh, I don't know that it's no, going to show up exactly so next week. So we will actually have a, have a demo for you next week, and then there are there are we have found some hardening requirements on the security side of it. So we would harden it first before we release it for preview. Yeah. So I, I would say in the next four weeks, you should have a service which you can preview and use. Yep, but that, that is only going to help with the backup side of things. It won't help with the restore side, which is where this, this code Expressive. comes in. Yeah. OK. Is it recommended to use SSL between inter-service connections in your cluster? And if so, it's the use of remoting connections between services done over a secure connection. Uh, it's really a question for your lawyers. At least that's usually what it comes down to. I, I don't see a reason to do it because there's a huge CPU overhead to doing SSL. 
and for your backend services, they should be they should be in a trusted boundary anyway. So there shouldn't be a really there shouldn't be much of a reason to have to do encrypted communication between them, other than to say at some point if something does go wrong, you can say, well, we did everything we could by encrypting traffic. But practically, I don't see a good reason to do it. I, I've seen some use for it, where but mainly as a source of catching my own bugs. So if, if you ha if you have set it up very, and it takes a lot of effort to set this up correctly because services are moving around, they have different identities, it's very hard to get configured correctly. But it can help you find issues where one service thinks it should be talking to service A, and it's actually talking to service B. And now you have errors of authentication, you have errors of, you know, where you can't establish communication, and you see those errors. Whereas if those, if A and B are the same service type that have the same API, and there's no authentication or verification that those calls are coming in uh, correctly, uh, then you might send an API request to the wrong place. But there's lots of other ways to bake that protection into your services. Um, yeah. I'm just saying that that is one case where I've seen it prevent bugs or prevent issues. But on the whole, I agree with us. Uh, SSL it's, for it's yeah. heavy yeah. for that purpose. SSL for authentication might be a use case if you have a multi-tenancy scenario and you need to make sure that services authenticate to each other. Right. Uh, but strictly for on the wire encryption, um, I think it's, I don't think it's strictly necessary, but again, that's something that you'd probably want to run by a legal team. Yeah, well, and one thing I'd also uh, comment on that got released recently is the identity team, key vault team released managed service identities for VMs. And so that allows you to pull down and upgrade uh, certificates and do auto upgrade of certificates from key vaults onto the underlying VMs. And so that makes it a lot easier now. You can just do a local call from your uh, application to get hold of the cert. And they have an agent that runs there called uh, um, the uh, MSI, or I think it's called the Key Vault extension. And the Key Vault extension will actually pull down certificates and keep them up to date on your machine. So it makes it considerably easier to manage certs now um, across the whole of the cluster and the applications that you're using it. OK. So, so would that be? Uh, safe in saying that uh, the remote connections then are not secure using the remoting? Uh, by default, they're not. Okay. There's there's an option to to apply a layer of, of um, encryption on top of it, though. Uh, okay. All right, thanks. Yeah, it uses the client communication cert by default. I think so, yeah. So if that's set up, yeah. Then you have that, but that's still not that's not quite the same as authentication. It's not authentication, no, it's yeah. just encrypted over the wire. Yeah. Which again adds a lot of CPU overhead. So So it does do encryption over the wire between if connections? You, if you have a client connection cert set up, right, where your your this the cluster itself is secure and you have to have that cluster or, or that client or admin cert in order to connect to the cluster. Yes. And at least as far as I know, if you have that set up and you set up are you doing this via code or via like PowerShell or something like that? I'm just talking about the the remoting between services, the okay. the so, native. So when you connecting. when you set up the remoting thing, there's an option to specify a fabric client that gets set in there. Mm -hmm. um, when you create that fabric client, you have an option to set it up using encryption and specify the cert and all this other complicated stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're doing that, then it would use that secure channel. If not, then it then I don't believe that it will encrypt things. Uh, by default. It, do, it doesn't do it by default, but right. it's configurable. You can, yeah. you can turn it on. And it, yeah, I just noticed you guys have all the, like, the information about setting up the proxy to communicate over SSL and everything internally. So I was just wondering if that was a recommendation to do it that way since you have that ability, I guess. Well, most of the time with that proxy, it's about SSL forwarding. So it's about I, I'm calling my gateway service and then I want to do SSL to a back-end service and do it through until it'll do a forwarding through the proxy to that back-end service. Well, that's 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 the reverse proxy. That's the HTTP reverse proxy oh, that does that. Yeah, sorry. He's, yeah. he's asking about remoting oh, yeah, the service proxy. And yeah, so remoting, again, remoting has an option to turn it on. Whether it's recommended or not, I generally, I would say no, because your your communication between back-end services should be in a trusted boundary anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time you turn it on, I would think, is either if you get if you have a requirement from your legal team that says we require you to have all um, all communication encrypted, which comes up in, for example, uh, medical applications, yep. 
um, or potentially financial. Yeah. So that's that again. That's a decision you have to make based on your your uh, legal requirements. Um, I wouldn't turn it on by default because of the overhead that it introduces, and it tends not to be necessary. Again, unless you have a multi-tenancy scenario where you need authentication between services, then that's a different story. But for encryption specifically, I wouldn't turn on my default unless that's a legal requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Application gateway mapping. Uh, we can always skip the yeah. .NET Core. Actually, we already answered the yeah. So .NET Core, uh, the three point SDK, which we'll have a preview of in a couple weeks. Again, that will allow you to target .NET Core two point at that point. Uh, 2.8, the 2.8 release is still pulled on that framework, but those are coming out around the same time. Um, in Sweden, it is 7.30. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there a way to configure the application gateway? Uh, the reverse uh, proxy, yes. Okay, I see what you're doing. So a application gateway, I assume you mean Azure application gateway. Oh, Azure um, gateway. I see what you're doing here. Yeah, I was looking at this a little bit earlier. So you're trying to map a domain name to a URL path in the back end. So I actually don't know of a way to do that with Application Gateway. I'm not sure that you can, because Application Gateway tends to do routing by domain or path, but to a back end pool of machines. So I don't know if they do domain to a URL path on the same port on the same back end set of machines. I don't think it has that capability. Um, it might be something that we can bring up with the Application Gateway team, but I've never seen it used that way. Uh, typically, you'll need some other proxy that is that can do that kind of routing, um, something like uh, Nginx or? Well, with Application Gateway, it actually, what it, it has like the ability to, you know, connect to the proxy port. And then in the back end settings, you can specify like a path. And it's my understanding that if you do the path of the application slash the service, as long as it's a singleton service, you are able to connect. I just wasn't having success with it. feels like the settings are there. I'm just, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Are you sure it's, are you sure that backend setting is allowing you to map a domain name to a URL path in the backend? Well, so you can, you can, um, in the request routing area or whatever, you can take right. and, and, and map the listeners to yeah. specific backend settings. And I just have different backend settings with different paths for different paths to different services. Hmm. I have to take a closer look at that. I'm not sure if that works. If you can, if you can do that, then it should work with the reverse proxy just fine. Because all you're doing is mapping uh, host, basically a host name, host header, to a port and a path, a URL path. So and if you can do that, it should work just fine. Yeah. It, it would just be a lot cleaner setup to use the proxy than it would be to, to play with always every time I need a subdomain, I gotta use a different oh, yeah. port and everything. Yeah, I could map it to ports, but it's not as yeah, fun. It is yeah, possible to configure services to like listen on their own host names and all this stuff, but it's a real pain. Yeah, but then that's that's a manual work every time you add a new service yeah. now, so you don't want to do that. Yeah. Um yeah, let me see if I can take a closer look at that. That's a good question. Um yeah. I think we should spend some more time on that. We'll try and get back to you on that one. Or we'll post a, a question on the GitHub issues. Yeah, again, if you post that up on GitHub issues, we can we can get back to you out there. Okay. Time to okay, I can put my settings up there, minutes. what I have, and kind of show you then, I guess. Yeah, that, that would be helpful, yeah. Definitely. Okay, let's try and get through the remaining questions, because um, everyone would like to get Okay, to lightning them. round. <laughs> Will there be a better secondary index support on reliable dictionaries? Um, even if it's exposed sometime with the previous entity. Yeah, we want to we want to enable that, but it's not going to be today. Today, you'd have to build it um, based on the notification events that uh, show up. So in a notification event, you have to build all the indices that you want yourself. Um, we want to make that easier, but it's not uh, it's not going to be automatic anytime soon. Okay. Uh, what is the process for patch orchestration? Uh, I hear you have to do this all yourself. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. It is. As, so there are two things in here. So as of today, the answer is yes, you have to deploy the patch orchestration application to your cluster. That actually is the only supported service fabric cluster patching mechanism for VMs. Okay. So uh, that is recommended at this point. Uh, towards November, December, there, there would be a, another, another offering coming up, which is, says that you can patch uh, VMSs itself as from a definition perspective. So that will be image-based patching that's coming. And as soon as it comes, that will be our recommended approach. And this will just be an additional thing that you would have uh, to catch up with 
uh, with patches which come out in between the new images. So hopefully that answers. A quick question about the image patching. Uh, is the image patching going to uh, destroy the contents of temporary drive? Uh, it is not supposed to do that. Uh, I say it's supposed to in uh, very carefully. Uh, in, in, the, in the course of, so what will happen basically is it's an in-place upgrade, so it'll actually go UD by UD. It will not be blasting out. So in the process of patching, if that VM becomes unresponsive, then the VM will be migrated over. At that point, temporary drive will be lost. If okay. not, you will get it back. Okay, next. So, uh, there's another patching orchestration question. Same, uh, yeah, same, same, same person. Yeah. Okay. Every service fabric project and visuals to you comes with its own service event source, and then you want to customize them, and then you want to put them into a single place, but that breaks diagnostic events. I know that we're looking at how to fix this, but fundamentally, this is the event source? Yeah. And if Carol has How to make it not that. static, basically. I yeah, I thought that in .NET 461, you could at least pass the, uh, the event source name in programmatically rather than as an attribute. That helps. I know helps. that also in .NET Core, I can inject it into a bunch of places, but that's still not yeah. going to move it to yeah. a common library. Right. I haven't tried doing this, actually, in a while. Um, Carol, who was on the call earlier, might be able to help. Um, if not, or if you can't figure it out, I would open up an issue and we should we should figure this one out. Yeah. He also might have some better ideas, but he's not here right now, unfortunately. Yeah, open a GitHub issue. That's yeah. always best to see. That way we have a record space. of it and we can work through it. Yep. Any plans for opening up underscore F W <laughs> of debug params magic? Which allows you to hook into the uh, debugger. That's a good question. We hadn't we hadn't thought about opening that up, but um, if you have a if you have a use case that that makes sense, we'll take a look at that and okay. we'll take a look at the stack yeah. overflow. Oh, you got a stack overflow link. Perfect. Yeah. We'll take a look at that one. Yeah. I, I know that we we did do some magic there uh, to make the debugger do the right thing. Um, we can figure that out and see if there's some way to document or explain that so that other people can take advantage of it. Yeah, it, I didn't. Yes, we just. Yeah, it's it's internal implementation details right now, so I probably wouldn't mess with it because there's no guarantee that it's always <laughs> work the same way from one release to another. But um, yeah, thanks, thanks for bringing that up, though. We will look at opening that up. Uh, is there any way to do a blast deployment, upgrade all the domains at the same time? Uh, no. No, please don't. Don't do that. Uh, get used to your, go get a coffee. Do an upgrade, go get a coffee, come back, be, be bewildered and amazed by how safe and, and good your upgrades were. Um, I mean, if you really want to, you can delete the existing thing and recreate it. That's what the F5 uh, experience is going to do in VS by default. But we're very concerned about safety, and what we found typically is that when we give people these types of knobs, somehow they escape into production, and then they cause outages. And we really hate that. But maybe you're asking something else here rather than dev environment. You do realize in a dev environment there are different ways of doing upgrading. You can turn, you can just do a single faster deployment on a single node with inside your machine rather than having to do an upgrade for one. There's also the the in place one, which if is your dev, if by dev environment you mean your actual local like machine your machine that you're on, yeah. There's a there's a mode if you're doing if you're using Visual Studio if you right click your application project, there are options for um, for upgrade modes for when you when you re relaunch the application for Visual Studio. There's one called refresh mode, and that one actually doesn't require a full rolling upgrade. It'll just refresh the files. So basically, as soon as you if you're doing a web project for example, as soon as you save a JavaScript file or an HTML file, it'll just automatically reflect in the cluster because we use uh, we basically use symbolic links between your files. We set that up for you. Uh, or you can just recompile the changes will show up. You have to be on a one node local cluster for that, but that's probably the fastest way to do it. Uh, uh, no, I was referring to a, a dev environment in Azure. Um, in Azure, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I've reduced kind of the health checking timeout after yeah, each upgrade chain. Uh, yeah. But I, I wasn't aware of any other options in this. No. You can help out. You can turn the health check down to like its minimum, and it'll just so that is fast. that is the that is the fastest. Yeah, you can you can okay. reduce it to to maybe one second or something. But okay. five, sorry, five, five seconds is the minimum you can do. Is there a way to that's the polling yeah. 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 Is there a way to connect Azure files from within inside the Windows Docker containers brought up by Service Fabric? I mean, you should be able to, but we don't know volume, anything about it. It's yeah. such a volume. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a volume, volume attached. There's volume attached, but I don't think it's one for. There's not one for Windows today. Don't know. So I don't think you can. Is the answer to that one? Um, so no. That's what, that's what we talked about earlier on. 
uh, the building a volume driver for Docker to attach to Azure storage technologies. Um, can you share a link with the project, please? That was pretty perfect one we talked about, was it? I think yeah, the, the, per, the perf scale test yeah. project. Yeah. Um, we can get that to you. Yeah. Would it be possible to distribute cluster nodes across regions, continents, <laughs> places my <might> users? <laughs> so there are some announcements <laughs> coming. Oh, stay from, stay from, tuned. From, stay from tuned. Network network. <laughs> so we would be leveraging it. So I don't want to give away what network is going on, networking is announcing. So whatever they're announcing, that's going to help us do this. So once that is there, we have runtime knobs, which will allow you to do affinity towards yeah. certain places and also have one cluster which goes across. Yeah, so let's just say with availability zones and cross regions, we can build clusters that span all of that. And yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty excited by it. Yeah. So come to the talk or uh, listen to the talk. Uh, is the current uh, state of container networking your last word? Or are there serious investments in the area? I think there's serious investments in the area, and we're working with the Windows team to try and fix as much of this stuff as possible. Well, actually, there are serious investments, in it, you can, and they're having an announcement in the release next week. So right now, um, in the release, even in the current release, we did. So the, there's three types of networking we're doing. One is the NAT-based networking, where you have ports mapped down to the host IP addresses. In the release, you'll have come out next week, and I think it was even in the 5.7, is a networking mode called open. And that means that every container will get its own right currently now. And um, so you'll see that when you deploy your containers, you'll see that when you deploy your containers and you have a, uh, you have a, a virtual network deployed with a, a subnet range, so it's like it's 10.0.0.x, your containers will have their own IP addresses, um, as well as the nodes having their own IP addresses. So that means now you can actually reference the IP address and port. And the advantage of that is you can actually have multiple containers with the same port deployed to the same machine. And then the final one that we'll have is isolated networks, where all of the applications deployed with inside our own VNet. So yes. Speed, speed to speed. Uh, any any uh, enhancements to the uh, refresh mode, I think, is what Greg's referring to. Uh, refresh mode, yeah. So that that'll be coming out of preview pretty soon. Um, just uh, just the only enhancements, just that just stability and bug fixes and things like that. Um, but it, look look out for that. That'll be out of preview fairly soon in one of the upcoming Visual Studio releases. Visual Studio 2017 releases. When is running Windows Docker containers on a dev machine going to be supported within Service Fabric? Pretty soon um, yeah. is the answer. We tried to get it for this release, uh, but the answer is is we actually have it now working. And it'll be in the next release where inside Visual, this is what we're planning for, in the next release inside Visual Studio, inside a service fabric project, you'll be able to do F5 debugging of Windows containers in the same way that you can do it with Compose projects. So it's a, quite an important scenario for us. And it'll make container Docker debugging super simple with service fabric projects inside Visual Studio. Does the forthcoming announcement of cross-region stuff handle Key Vault? <laughs> yes, so those will be local localized. So yeah. key vaults will have to be local. They will not be global. Lots of things in Azure are still going to end up being per region. Um, Which is fine. For the foreseeable future. Yeah. You just end up with more of them, and you have to figure out what to do about that. <laughs> OK. We made it. So that answers your last question on Windows 10. So yeah, Windows 10 support for container debugging on service fabric is coming soon. Yeah. Not next release, but the one after. OK. We come screeching to a halt. <laughs> okay, hopefully we addressed all your questions. As always, you know, fun time talking to you. GitHub issues is a great place to answer questions. Stack Overflow is another great place. Yeah, and and anything we can get to, throw no, that up on GitHub yeah. first. Is there any plan to release a service like the patch service for managing That's service? managed service identities, which we're working on integrating with. That'll, that'll solve the same problem. Uh, and with yes. that? Well, use managed service identities right now. That's the best way of doing that. Um, the announcement from the Active Directory, Key Vault team. Yep. Uh, that key vault extension. Okay. okay. Fantastic. See you at Ignite next week. Come Thanks and find us. We'll get, we have t-shirts and stickers if you turn up early. Yes, show up, show up. <laughs> we have, we're finally starting to get swag. Hey, look, we got a heart. All right. Yeah. All right. Aw, thanks. Uh, thank you. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, we'll see thanks you a lot. Yep. <laughs>